Let's go to Saint Luigi de France to learn about a painter that was on the run. A painter that was inspired by Raphael. This painter came after the era of Raphael, after the Renaissance period, and started the Baroque period. So this is the National Roman Catholic Church of France in Rome. Quite a mouthful. For quite a while wanted to have the Pope based in Avignon, including the namesake of this church, St. Louis IX. St. Louis IX wasn't quite so saintly. He was very notorious. He actually ended up uh, chastising his wife because she had sex with him. I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> it was that pious. Uh, and also he um, severely punished many of his servants uh, physically. So St. Louis the Ninth, not so saintly. Let's walk inside the church and we'll learn about a painter that definitely wasn't saintly at all. yourselves. We're about to see one of the most famous painters of all Italian history. This painter changed art for good. He started the Baroque period after the Renaissance painters like Raphael and Michelangelo painted Divine figures filled with light and color, Caravaggio, went dark and dramatic. Look at that. So this is the painting of the hour. Jesus Christ pointing his finger at St. Matthew. They're all dressed in the modern in the contemporary Renaissance fashion, uh, but it's depicting, depicting a very biblical scene of Jesus calling St. Matthew. St. Matthew used to be a money man, a money lender. And the interesting thing about the Baroque is that Jesus is completely covered in shadow. Caravaggio was very poignant with his colors, painting the blackest of blacks that have been seen ever since that time in art history. Now, a few of the money lenders, uh, one of them is actually kind of surprised. We have Matthew kind of pointing himself, saying, Who? Me? Am I really a chosen one? And Jesus, without any kind of hint of emotion or hint of anything, he just points at Matthew, kind of with this full certainty. And the two money lenders in the back are not even paying attention at all, kind of showing that some people are a little bit more further spiritually developed than others. St. John the Baptist is the one who's covering Jesus. I 
think this is probably one of the most kind of poignant images of Jesus because since he's covered in shadow and you kind of barely see him, it kind of seems more magical of a, of a character in this uh, painting. And here we have two other Caravaggio paintings. Now this one is very dramatic. So, as I mentioned, the Renaissance was kind of very light and divine and transcendent. Uh, beautiful landscapes, usually very flat and tabula rasa style, but Baroque ended up being very dramatic, kind of in your face, almost as if there was a camera lens that was kind of going right into the action. So this is more Renaissance style, right here, and that's Baroque. Renaissance, Baroque. You know what they say, don't fix it if it ain't Baroque. So Caravaggio painted these very dramatic images that were dark, shadowy, also filled with kind of this angst. Well, I think it reflected a whole lot of Caravaggio's life because Caravaggio towards the end of his life was on the run. One of his very final paintings or his definite final painting was head decapitated held by a person however the likeness of the head was his own caravaggio's own face on that decapitated head but why did caravaggio paint his decapitated head well it's because he was on the run he had a bounty on his head if his head was brought over to, in the basket over to the Pope. It would be given a reward. Caravaggio murdered a man in cold blood, carrying an illegal sword. He ran away to Malta, tried to become a knight in the Maltese order. And the Maltese order really loved Caravaggio and kind of forgot all the murder ordeal because some of the members themselves came from very dark backgrounds. And he became a knight, but becoming a knight wasn't going to save Caravaggio. So in haste, he started painting his final work, the decapitated head in his own likeness, in order to gift it to the Pope. If the Pope couldn't get it, he was trying to get it to the Borghese family. The Borghese family was one of his top patrons, and he was hoping that at least they would get their hands on it so they can bring him to the Pope. So Caravaggio bringing the painting along with him down along the coast of Calabria, up towards Naples, tried to catch a boat to Rome. However, the boat never came. Caravaggio tried to go on foot. The thing is, with that coast of Italy, it's very swampy and very hot, no shade. Caravaggio, carrying this heavy painting of a decapitated head, ran and ran and ran until he fully collapsed. He died at 39 years old, on the run, trying to not give his physical head because he did not want to die, he wanted to live, trying to give his head in a painting. Would that, would that have convinced the Pope? Who knows? But Caravaggio, very controversial figure, painted those paintings in there and it's no wonder that they were filled with so much drama because he himself filled, lived a life filled with drama. There's another painter that lived a life filled with drama. However, 
Luckily, this contemporary to Caravaggio led a very different life. So brace yourselves for one of the strangest sculptures outdoors in Rome, built by a contemporary of Caravaggio, another man who innovated Baroque architecture, painting, and a few other forms, including sculpture. His name is Bernini. And Bernini also was a man who rose to fame very quickly, like Caravaggio, very early in age, in his early 20s. And fame got to his head. So much so that he flaunted all his fame and wealth. He slept with many, many different women. And also he had a very strong fight with his own brother that almost led to murder. But first, let me show you the very strange sculpture that's right in front of me. It's kind of, you see at first glance, you might think, uh, oh, that's weird. But then you look at it, it's like, wait, wait, wait a minute. What, what's happening here? Here is Bernini's elephant in the obelisk. There's a cross on top. It's an Egyptian obelisk with the hieroglyphics and a elephant. What's happening here? Well, Bernini was kind of playing a, like a slide joke on the Romans of that time. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church controlled most of Italy, peninsula, and most of Europe overall. And there was kind of a lot of this belief of connecting the grounded earth, in essence, kind of the blood of Christ, and connecting with the heavens above, the divinity in each and every one of us. The elephant at that time was the symbolism of groundedness of our earthly selves. Also, it was a symbol of piety in terms of our own sexuality. Because the elephants, according to what they studied at that time, found out that they only mated once every five years. And for some reason, the Catholic Church thought that was a very good example for them to lead. Bernini is playing a joke on kind of the Catholic Church because Bernini he was a man who loved to live on the edge, similar to Caravaggio. However, Caravaggio was nowhere near as charismatic as Bernini. Bernini, while Caravaggio went, let fame go to his head, no one really liked him. He was really angry all the time. But Bernini let fame go to his head, but he was very well liked. Everyone loved him. He was very popular uh, with the Romans and also with the women, the high class of the city. So Bernini is kind of saying a sly, oh yeah, I love to love. And I'm staying close to earth while allowing some divinity into my life. How they lowered the obelisk without breaking those marble corners. You know what? That's actually one of the mysteries of Rome, ancient Rome. No one really knows how they transport these very heavy obelisks. This one is, is, is much smaller than the other ones. There's some obelisks that are twice larger than the one we saw in New York City, Cleopatra's Needle. Those obelisks are five tons heavy. To move something five tons heavy, even with current day technology, is very difficult. You would need these huge cranes. However, somehow the Romans did it? No one really knows for sure. Of course, there are theories. Right in front of us, we have another church in this Plaza de Minerva. And this church unfortunately is closed. But this church was the church where Galileo had his trial for committing heresy against the Catholic Church after claiming that the earth was not the center of the universe, that the sun was. He was charged over here. However, right next to the side of this church are some interesting plaques that really show that Rome was an ever-changing city. It might be called the Eternal City, but it was also eternally changing because of the, vi uh, the virulent river Tiber that tend to flood and change shapes. This is the plaques that mark all the floods. The latest of these plaques date back to the 1500s, but the earliest are more than 2,000 years old. And they say the exact date that the River Tiber flooded. And they also mark the waterline 
Now, I don't know if it's fully accurate, but you can imagine that the water line at least went up to here. So you can imagine this area of Rome, which is amongst the lowest areas of Rome, it's kind of like in a little valley in the middle of the city, got flooded to this point over here. So Venice is not the only Italian city that uh, suffered through flooding. However, luckily Rome, they end up walling up the River Tiber so they avoided many of those issues.